as we turn now to Dr. Noam Chomsky, professor of linguistics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, came to New York last night to speak at a forum at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. He discusses U.S. Korea foreign relations. Well, let me uh, begin with the most immediate uh, crisis right now in U.S. Uh, Asia relations and a very da uh, dangerous one, uh, namely with regard to North Korea. That's the one uh, non-Muslim member of the famous axis of evil. Uh, the members are the prime potential targets of attack under the national uh, security uh, strategy that was announced last September. As you'll recall, the uh, doctrine declares in effect that the United States uh, intends to rule the world by force and uh, will act uh, forcefully if it chooses uh, to eliminate any challenge to that uh, domination. The uh, official version defined challenge in terms of possession of weapons of mass destruction, the uh, pretext for the uh, invasion of Iraq. Uh, it's become a little difficult to sustain and the doctrine has accordingly been modified modified. Uh, now challenges defined in terms of what's called ability and intention to develop weapons of mass destruction. That suffices for attack. Well, uh, virtually everyone has the ability, uh, including Stony Brook High, assuming it has a chemistry and biology lab. Uh, so that uh, reduces to intention. Uh, and the implication is that the United States uh, 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 takes, accepts the right, arrogates to itself the right to attack uh, anyone it chooses. Well, these doctrines are not completely new. They considerably extend policies that go all the way back to World War II. Uh, the underlying principle was uh, expressed uh, lucidly by Henry Kissinger in an important speech uh, just 30 years ago, 1973, 1973 was the year of Europe, and Kissinger gave an important address called the Year of Europe Address, uh, in which he uh, warned Europeans not to strike an independent course in world affairs. He instructed them that they and others have regional responsibilities within the overall framework of order that uh, is maintained by the United States, global order. Uh, and it's now... Uh, declaring uh, far more expansive ambitions. Well, going back to the axis of evil, uh, North Korea is the most dangerous and the ugliest of the three members, uh, but it's the lowest on the list of targets. Uh, so why is that so? Well, to be a target, a country has to meet uh, several conditions. First of all, it has to be defenseless, uh, and secondly, it has to be important and Iraq qualified on both counts. Uh, North Korea, however, uh, fails the first condition. It has a deterrent, uh, massed artillery aimed at Seoul uh, and at U.S. forces in the south. Uh, hence, it cannot be attacked with complete impunity. Uh, that will remain a problem unless the Pentagon figures out the way to uh, eliminate the deterrent uh, instantly with precision-guided weapons, maybe tactical nukes. Actually, the problem is being relieved in a way which South Korea regards as rather ominous. Uh, the U.S. troops are being withdrawn uh, to south of Seoul, or so the plans are, which uh, could be uh, under interpreted in a rather uh, ugly way, which I won't go into. Uh, what about the second criterion, uh, importance? Well, North Korea itself is of no importance. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. It's uh, barely surviving. It has no resources to speak of. Uh, nevertheless, it happens to be highly important. Hence, it's a potential target uh, if it can be rendered defenseless. And it's important to understand why, that's a, why it's important. That's a central part of evolving U.S.-Asia relations now. Uh, the background reasons are... Uh, uh, actually well described in a recent uh, study by, of Northeast Asia, 
by a uh, prestigious uh, task force. It's chaired by uh, Zella Harrison, who's one of the leading specialists on the region. I'll quote you a couple of comments. Uh, Northeast Asia, the task force writes, is now the epicenter of international commerce and technical innovation. Collectively, Japan, South Korea, China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong have constituted the fastest growing economic region in the world for much of the past two decades, and today account for nearly a third of global GDP, uh, far ahead of the United States. Approximately half of global foreign exchange reserves are held by Northeast Asian countries. Uh, they also account for nearly half of global inbound foreign direct investment, and they're also becoming an increasing source of outbound foreign direct investment in uh, Asia and uh, also to Europe and North America. Uh, Russia and China, part of the system, are both rich in natural resources. Uh, the economic unification and stability of the two Koreas would be greatly enhanced by the development of uh, uh, gas pipelines that are now projected through North Korea from uh, 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 eastern Siberia uh, and from Sakhalin uh, through the north to the south. Uh, similarly, the projected extension of the Trans-Siberian Railroad through North Korea to the south would transform the peninsula and contribute uh, further to the uh, economic cooperation between Korea and its neighbors. Well, that's the background. North Korea is right in the middle of it. The uh, task force uh, ad uh, advises the United States to follow the lead of neighboring countries and to seek to negotiate North Korea's step-by-step uh, -step peaceful integration into the region. Uh, but from Washington's point of view, that poses serious problems, conflicts with the Kissinger Doctrine and the much more expansive uh, national security strategy. Uh, uh, and Kissinger was by no means the first. Uh, Northeast uh, uh, Asia is an integrated region, has rich resources, uh, rapidly developing industrial centers that need the resources, uh, half the world's financial reserves, and so on. It could go off on an independent course, uh, just as continental Europe could with its German-French industrial base, uh, part of the reason for the intense hostility to Germany and France in recent months, and in fact beyond. Uh, well, that raises the problem that Kissinger outlined, and it's been a significant problem since the, uh, uh, the United States gained a position of global dominance after World War II. Uh, in this case, the problem of potential independence of the Northeast Asian region is an impediment to the peaceful diplomatic settlement of the Korean crisis, North Korean crisis, that appears to be the goal of uh, all the countries in the region, including North Korea. Uh, well, there may be some other impediments. Uh, North Korea may have some other memories in mind. Uh, here we have to recall a characteristic difference between the culture of conquerors and victims. Uh, quite typically, the powerful send history to the mem memory hole or the else they sanitize it for their benefit. Uh, the weak don't uh, have that uh, privilege and they tend to remember history. So it's unlikely, for example, that North Koreans uh, have forgotten what the US Air Force called an object lesson in air power to all the communists in the world, and especially to the communists in North Korea. Uh, that lesson, I'm quoting from a, an enthusiastic report in an official Air Force history, uh, that lesson was uh, delivered a month before the armistice 50 years ago. Uh, there were no targets left in the flattened country, so US bombers were sent to destroy irrigation dams. Quoting again, uh, irrigation dams that furnished 75% of the controlled rice supply for North Korea's rice production. The Westerner can little conceive the awesome meaning which the loss of this staple commodity has for the Asian, starvation and slow death, hence the show of rage, the flare of violent tempers, and the avowed threat of reprisal uh, from the Asians uh, reacting um, to this reenactment
of the kind of crimes that led to death sentences at Nuremberg. Uh, one may reasonably wonder whether uh, such memories are in the background as their uh, desperate leadership plays a kind of nuclear chicken. Professor Noam Chomsky speaking at Stony Brook University in New York last night. We're going to come back to his speech in just a minute. You are listening to Democracy Now!, the War and Peace Report, as we continue with Professor Noam Chomsky, author of many books, professor of linguistics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, among his latest books, Power and Terror, and another book, Pirates and Emperors, Old and New International Terrorism in the Real World. In this speech, he addresses the issue of U.S.-Korean relations. Well, South Koreans have plenty of memories, too. Uh, for example, on Jeju Island, which was the scene of the massacre of uh, maybe 40,000 people in 1948 by forces under the control of the U.S. military. So a large component of the roughly 100,000 killed by uh, the U.S. client regime, U.S. military-backed regime uh, in South Korea. That's before what we call the Korean War. Uh, perhaps South Koreans also uh, recall more recently uh, Washington's role 15 years ago when the Reagan-Bush administration uh, continued to give strong support to the brutal dictatorships and tried to prevent the democratization of South Korea, uh, which has been a remarkable achievement, as remarkable as its economic development and a kind of model for the world. Uh, well, there could be other memories uh, which have a lot to do with the current situation. For example, memories from 1951. 1951 was the year of the San Francisco Peace Treaty, which formally ended the war on, in Asia. It's not known very well here, as far as I'm aware, at least I don't ever come across it. Uh, the war in Asia, of course, was uh, primarily a war fought by Japan against uh, countries of Asia. Uh, later, it became a uh, US-led Western war with Japan uh, after Pearl Harbor. And at the San Francisco Treaty, uh, 1951 brought the war to an end. Well, who took part? Uh, from Asia, uh, three French colonies in Indochina took part. Uh, apart from them, the only Asian countries that supported the peace treaty were Pakistan and Ceylon, both of them recent uh, British colonies that were remote from the Asian wars. Uh, India refused to attend because of the terms of the treaty, in particular the U.S. insistence on retaining Okinawa as a military base, as it still does, over strong protests from Okinawans, uh, which are ignored and largely unknown in the United States. Uh, Truman uh, was outraged by India's disobedience, its refusal to attend or support the treaty, uh, just as his heirs are outraged today by the decision of uh, the Turkish government to ab abide by the wishes of 95% of the population instead of following orders from Washington. It's a crime for which they were berated uh, last week by Paul Wolfowitz, uh, who's depicted as the uh, leader of the crusade to democratize the Middle East, uh, apparently without irony. Uh, Truman uh, wrote uh, no less elegantly than Wolfowitz that India must have consulted Uncle Joe and Mousy Dung. Uh, notice that the white man got a name, uh, not just a vulgar outburst. Uh, partly that may be ordinary racism, or perhaps it was because uh, Truman genuinely admired uh, Old Joe, as he called him. Uh, Old Joe, Truman said in 1948, was a decent and honest man. Uh, Old Joe reminded him of the Missouri boss Tom Pendergrass who started him off on his career. Uh, Mousy Dung, on the other hand, was a yellow devil. Uh, well, these distinctions just extend wartime propaganda. Uh, anyone my age can recall that uh, the Nazis may have been bad guys, uh, but they merited a certain respect. Uh, they were, after all, uh, white, uh, blue-eyed, uh, blonde, at least in the stereotype. Uh, Japanese, however, were quite different. They were just vermin to be crushed. That is, once they became enemies. Uh, 
although before that uh, the United States was quite tolerant of their depredations in Asia as long as uh, U.S. business interests were protected. Actually, that went on up till days before Pearl Harbor. Uh, and the same factors uh, distinguish uh, Uncle Joe from uh, Mao Zedong. Well, uh, Korea was not even invited to the uh, San Francisco Peace Conference, uh, nor Taiwan, which uh, was regarded as China then by the United States. Korea, Taiwan, and China were the primary victims of Japanese fascism uh, and its predecessors. Uh, quoting a Japanese scholar, Japan's racist wartime ideology, which had propelled atrocities against Asian soldiers and civilians alike, escaped uh, scrutiny and condemnation under the U.S. military occupation uh, and also the peace treaty. Koreans and Chinese received no reparations from Japan, uh, and Secretary of State Dulles personally intervened to ensure that there would be no reparations for Filipinos. Uh, he condemned the Filipinos for what he called their emotional prejudices, uh, which kept them from comprehending that they would have no relief uh, for the uh, torture that uh, they endured. Uh, there were Japanese reparations, namely to the United States and to other Western colonial powers, uh, and uh, reimbursement from Japan uh, to the United States for the cost of the occupation. Uh, Japan's liabilities were restricted to the period beginning on December 7, 1941, although, of course, Japan was responsible for far more severe uh, atrocities and aggression before that. However, before that, it was against Asians, so there was no liability under the terms of the occupation and the peace treaty. For its Asian victims, uh, Japan was to pay compensation, namely uh, export of Japanese manufactured products using South Asian resources. Uh, that was a central part of the reconstruction of the Asian system within the U.S. <coughs> global system after the Second World War. Uh, these were arrangements. <coughs> Could you pass me that bottle of water there? Oh, is there one here? Ah, thanks. Yeah, sorry. I'm talking so much in the last four weeks at Stony Brook. <laughs> must be a polluted atmosphere. <laughs> um, so Japan was to export, the compensation was that Japan would export uh, uh, manufactured products uh, to uh, using Southeast Asian resources. Uh, this was a, s a central part of the arrangements that restored to Japan, uh, in effect, the uh, new order in Asia that it had uh, attempted to gain by conquest and now it's restored to it, but under U.S. domination, so it was okay. Uh, this was, uh, what, uh, this was uh, Japan's empire toward the south, as it was described by the uh, head of the State Department planning staff, uh, George Kennan, uh, who helped design these policies. Uh, some Asian victims of Japanese fascism, uh, forced laborers, did bring suit uh, in California against Japanese corporations with subsidiaries in the United States, uh, corporations that were the legal successors of those responsible for the crimes. Uh, on the eve of the 50th anniversary of the peace treaty, their suit was dismissed by a California judge on grounds that their claims were barred uh, by the treaty. The State Department had filed a brief uh, in support of the accused Japanese corporations and relying on the brief, the judge ruled that, I'm quoting him, the San Francisco Peace Treaty had served to sustain U.S. security interests in Asia and to support peace and stability in the region. The uh, Asia historian John Price, one of the very few to have written about these things, uh, desc described this judgment as one of the more abysmal moments of denial uh, pointing out that at least 10 million Asians had been killed in wars uh, while Asia was uh, an oasis of peace and stability. Uh, elite opinion concerning these wars ranges, as it usually does, uh, over a spectrum from doves to hawks. So just keeping to the Indochina wars and uh, to recent ex-presidents, 
uh, Carter and Clinton were doves. Uh, Bush, number one, was a moderate, and Reagan was a hawk. Uh, Reagan uh, lauded the enterprise as a noble cause for which the victims of the aggression were completely to blame, along with Russia and China. Uh, Bush, number one, uh, the moderate, uh, informed the Vietnamese that although uh, we could never forgive them for the crimes they committed against us, uh, we would nevertheless be gracious and will not seek retribution for the past, he said, uh, as long as they dedicate themselves with sufficient zeal to the sole moral issue that remains after U.S. aggression that uh, led to the death of maybe four to five million people and the destruction of three countries. The sole moral issue, of course, is the fate of uh, American MIAs. Uh, Carter, on the other hand, at the other extreme, the Dove, uh, informed the press that we owe the Vietnamese no debt because the destruction was mutual, his words, perfectly obvious from a walk through Stony Brook and Quang Nai province. Uh, Clinton was still more forthcoming. True, he did force Vietnam to assume the debt uh, owed to Washington by the client regime that Washington had established as the local base for its war against uh, the internal aggression of the South Vietnamese against America. That's uh, Adlai Stevenson's phrase. Uh, but uh, Clinton magnanimously forgave part of that debt. Uh, so there is a spectrum of opinion from doves to hawks. The uh, spectrum of elite intellectual opinion is barely wider, although it's interesting that the general population has been radically different for 35 years. Uh, since 1969, uh, a large majority has consistently held that the war was fundamentally wrong and immoral, not a mistake. It's a view that's almost never voiced in respectable circles, meaning everyone made it up for themselves. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the um, usual reconstruction of history has succeeded with the public. Uh, in the only study of the matter that I know, an academic study at the University of Massachusetts, the uh, Policy Institute there, uh, it uh, asked people to estimate the number of Vietnamese deaths, and the median judgment was about 100,000. That's about 5% of the official U.S. figure and a much smaller percentage, very likely, of the actual figure. As far as I'm aware, these shocking reports uh, received uh, no comment or discussion. The authors of the academic study suggest that we might think there was some problem in Germany if the median estimate of Holocaust deaths were 300,000, but uh, such judgments are never applied by the victorious and the powerful to themselves. And if they're ever mentioned, they elicit uh, outrage and quite impressive tantrums. Uh, well, going back to Clinton's magnanimous gesture, it was explicitly modeled on a 1908 program that returned to China a portion of the indemnity uh, that it had been forced to pay for rebelling against its foreign masters, that's the Boxer Rebellion, and their earlier precedents. Uh, Haiti's liberation from French rule in 1804 shocked civilized opinion, uh, which was concerned that the virus of liberation might spread from the first free country in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, for obvious reasons, the danger was particularly acute in the United States, which took the lead in isolating the criminal state, uh, relented only in 1862 when destinations were being sought for freed slaves. Uh, Liberia was recognized in the same year for the same reasons. Uh, in punishment for its crime of liberation, uh, Haiti was compelled by France in 1825 to pay France a huge indemnity, uh, which guaranteed French domination and had a catastrophic effect on the society that France had devastated during its war of liberation. Now, this had been France's richest colony, the source of much of France's wealth, uh, but not enough. Haiti had to pay a huge indemnity for the crime of liberation. Uh, half a century before France's punishment of Haiti for its defiance of the norms of civilized behavior, uh, 
uh, George Washington set forth on the conquest of the advanced Iroquois civilization in New York. Uh, his goal, in his words, was to extirpate them from the country. And so he wrote to Lafayette on July 4th, 1779, and also to expand American boundaries westward toward the Mississippi. Uh, conquest of Canada uh, was barred by British force, although there were a few attempts beaten back. Uh, the town destroyer, as Washington was known to the indigenous population, completed his mission successfully. The Iroquois were then politely informed uh, that they would have to provide compensation for their treacherous resistance to their liberators. Uh, another Clinton, then governor of New York, informed the defeated tribes, quote him, that considering our losses, the debts we have incurred, and our former friendship, it is reasonable that you make to us a cession of your lands, as will aid us in repairing and discharging the losses and debts we have incurred. Uh, having as little choice as uh, Haitians and Chinese and Vietnamese and many others, in the face of overwhelming force, the Iroquois ceded their territory. Uh, only to discover that New York State proceeded at once to violate its solemn treaties, including this one, uh, and uh, to take the rest of the uh, territories through threats and deception and guile. Uh, a young American soldier later wrote home his words that I feel really guilty as I apply the torch to huts that were homes of content until we ravagers came spreading desolation everywhere but perhaps in a good cause, he added. Our mission here is ostensibly to destroy, but may it not transpire that we pillagers are carelessly sowing the seeds of empire. So some good could come out of it. And uh, citizens of New York, and for that matter of Massachusetts, continue to benefit from the seeds that were sown. And I'm sure all of this is taught in every elementary school in New York, uh, just as it should be. Professor Noam Chomsky speaking last night at the State University of New York, Stony Brook in Long Island. We're going to come back to his speech in just a minute here on Democracy Now! Stay with us. Breaking the silence, Lorena McKinnett here on Democracy Now!, the War and Peace Report. As we return to Noam Chomsky, professor of linguistics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, his book 911 has been number one on the New York Times bestseller list, was after 911 uh, for a very long time. He has come out with many books since, including Power and Terror. Today, we continue with a speech that he gave at the State University of New York at Stony Brook as he continues on the issue of empire, war, and terror. Well, the fact of the matter is that the inheritors of the seeds of empire uh, that were sown in this way, not only in New York State, uh, know very little about any of this, uh, just as they know very little, virtually nothing, about their deeds in Asia. Uh, but it's well to remember that the founding fathers who were carrying all this out in the early stages, uh, they were very well aware what they, of what they were doing. Uh, not some, like President Monroe, preferred to believe that, uh, in his words, we become in reality their benefactors by expelling the natives from their homes. Uh, but others had a somewhat clearer vision. So Secretary of War Knox, first Secretary of War, uh, warned that a future historian may mark the causes of this destruction of the human race in sable colors. Uh, John Quincy Adams, who had quite a horrendous record himself, uh, became an outspoken critic of the policies toward the indigenous population uh, well after he left power, described these policies as among the most heinous sins of this nation, for which I believe God will one day bring it to judgment, and he hoped that his belated stand might somehow aid that hapless race of Native Americans, which we are exterminating with such merciless and perfidious cruelty. But his uh, recantation had no effect on the extermination, which continued with full ruthlessness. Uh, so little is known about any of this, or at least understood, that the conquerors even proudly name their instruments of destruction uh, after the victims of virtual genocide. Uh, 
Actually, I think the U.S. may be unique among conquerors in this respect. So I suppose that some eyebrows would be raised if uh, the Luftwaffe were to call its uh, lethal attack helicopters a Jew and Gypsy. Uh, although there's no problem here if they're called Black Hawk and Apache. Uh, in fact, few would even know what those names signify. So, for example, how many even know that uh, Black Hawk was the leader of the resistance to the conquerors uh, in the 1830s in the Midwest, and after uh, his capture and imprisonment for his crime of resistance, he was paraded in triumph through American cities by the War Department, which uh, had a more honest name in those days. And there's no need to relate what happened to his people. Well, uh, let's go back to the period of the European conquest of much of Asia. Uh, according to World Bank estimates, in 1820, the economic distance between the richest and the poorest countries of the world was about three to one. And that rose to 35 to one by 1950 uh, to 72 to one by 1992. Uh, in the mid 18th century, beginning of the conquest, there was apparently no difference uh, in economic level between the more economically advanced centers of Europe and Asia. In fact, in many respects, the Asian countries were not only were probably more advanced than England, so recent scholarship suggests. Uh, China and India were major industrial and commercial centers, main ones in the world. Uh, East Asia was far ahead of Europe in uh, public health, probably in sophistication of market systems. Uh, life expectancy in Japan was apparently higher than Europe. Uh, Europe was trying to catch up in the late 18th century in textiles, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and other manufacturers. Uh, uh, other manufacturers. It was borrowing from India in ways that are now called piracy and are banned in the international trade agreements that have imposed by, been imposed by the rich states uh, once they use those methods, crucially the United States, uh, to uh, achieve a level of development. It's now imposed on everyone else. Uh, nobody would have developed if the current World Trade Organization rules were in place. Uh, in the 1820s, uh, British engineers were studying Indian steel making techniques in order to help English steel makers close the technological gap with India. It's a recent technical study in the United States. Uh, the future Duke of Wellington uh, equipped his troops with Indian artillery uh, for the uh, Napoleonic Wars uh, because they were better than British products. And he also uh, sought to acquire Indian ships for the same reason, uh, but that was barred by Parliament uh, to uh, protect uh, Britain's uh, infant uh, shipping industry. Uh, during the, that's how all of British industry developed, protection for, and, pow and state power for England, liberal forced liberalization for India, uh, and that just generalizes around the world. Uh, during the railroad age, uh, India probably had a comparative advantage in locomotive production, but that was rendered uh, inoperative by the British imperial preference system. I remember that this was during the period of enthusiasm for free trade, and it's not an unusual example of the way the concept is applied in practice. Uh, among the countries with large rail networks, India was the only one that failed to industrialize during the railroad era, and it was also the only colony among them unable to exercise sovereign rights. The uh, difference in industrial development between India and Japan is particularly striking. Quote a Indian economic historian, Daniel Thorner, it simply illustrates the difference in the direction and emphasis between a country running its own affairs and a dependency whose affairs were being managed by an external power. It's rather hard to overlook the fact that the countries that developed were those that retained their sovereignty. Western Europe and its offshoots and Japan, which resisted colonization. And incidentally, Japan's colonies, uh, which it did develop. Japan was a cruel and brutal conqueror, but unlike the uh, Western imperial powers, it developed its colonies at roughly the same rate as Japan itself. Uh, it, in fact, they, that's what's now Taiwan and Korea, South Korea all of Korea, uh, which then there was a lull 
during and after the Second World War, but then it picked up again. So its same pattern's been continuing. Uh, it wasn't until independence that uh, Indian development resumed the course that had been blocked by colonization. On the eve of independence in the mid-1940s, uh, life expectancy in India was about what it had been two centuries earlier. It's doubled since. That gives you a measure of the deaths, the, the murder caused by the colonization period. Uh, in the past half century of independence, there have been no major famines in India. Uh, in the last half of the preceding century, under British rule, some 30 million people died in famines, and they continued right until independence. Uh, China wasn't conquered until 150 years ago, when Britain forced China to accept British exports. Uh, China had not been interested in doing so, and the reason was well understood by British agents in the region. The problem was that uh, Britain's products were not competitive with China's own manufacturers, so they couldn't sell them in the Chinese market. That was actually the problem that Britain had faced in India a century earlier, and there it was overcome by uh, forcing India to liberalize while Britain retained powerful state controls and protection, a pattern, again, that has been replicated for every currently developed country, dramatically the United States. Uh, China was finally brought into the civilized world about 150 years ago by the Second Opium War, uh, which Britain fought uh, in order to turn China into a market for British goods. They couldn't sell them anything else, but they could sell them opium, and they forced them to accept it. Uh, incidentally, they also turned it into a nation of drug addicts. Uh, the rest of India was conquered at about the same time. That was largely motivated by the need to gain a monopoly of opium production, uh, which almost succeeded, but not quite, because Yankee traders were right behind, uh, along with a few others. This, again, was during the period of uh, enthusiasm about uh, free trade. Uh, Britain's narco-trafficking enterprise was quite awesome in scale, I mean, far and away the greatest in history. It, uh, its revenue subsidized the colonial regime in India. They sustained the East India Company in its day as the hub of uh, British commerce in the East. Uh, narco-trafficking also enabled Britain to purchase U.S. cotton. Remember, cotton was kind of the counterpart of oil in the 19th century. And uh, the same revenues uh, financed a good part of the costs of the Royal Navy, uh, which protected the empire. One British governor general commented that the drug addicts in China helped make the extension of British rule in China possible. They also, we can add, made the British rule in uh, India possible, and in fact uh, were a fundamental factor in uh, the Industrial Revolution uh, in uh, uh, England, later elsewhere, and the foundations of modern capitalism. Uh, the opium trade was called the poison trade. Uh, it had one major competitor, uh, which a recent English China historian describes the major competitor was, in his words, what was jocosely known in mercantile circles as the pig trade. Uh, he's referring to the people, the pigs, to the conquerors. Uh, the Chinese government was unable to protect its citizens after British uh, Britain forced it open and basically conquered it, uh, and therefore unlucky Chinese could be kidnapped or shanghaied in the term that entered the language, then shipped to America, uh, which uh, urgently needed them for what amounted to slave labor for a big part of American Industrial Revolution, railroads, and so on. Or they could be shipped to British plantations in the West Indies and elsewhere, uh, including women uh, sold to be girl slaves, as they were called. The uh, British uh, demonstrated their reverence for civilization when Lord, El Lord Elgin's troops during the Second Opium War destroyed the Summer Palace in Peking, uh, burning it to the ground after the uh, pillage of its rich artistic treasures. Uh, certain resonance to these barbaric acts today. Uh, at the time, they were heartily applauded by the great statesman Lord Palmerston as absolutely necessary in his words. He was joined by other exemplary figures.
the uh, actions owe much to the experience of Lord Elgin's soldiers, quote an English historian today, uh, Lord Elgin soldiers who formed their view of inferior races in India during the Indian Mutiny. Uh, Indian Mutiny is the term that's used in England for the Indian Rebellion of 1857, uh, which elicited an extraordinary outburst of savagery. Uh, we're allowed to do it to them, but they're not allowed to do it to us, a fraction of it. And in fact, the population of several states of India actually declined for the next generation. Well, all of this, uh, of course, it's only the bare sample. All that's been dispatched to the memory hole, uh, apart from corners of scholarship and people who care about it. So one hears very little about any of these things uh, in the current revival of uh, odes to empire and calls to renew its glories. Uh, many here, many in England, for example, Tony Blair's key foreign policy advisor, Robert Cooper, who uh, thoughtfully explains in his words that the need for colonization is as great as it ever was in the 19th century to bring to the rest of the world the principles of order, freedom, and justice, which the postmodern societies of the West uh, to which they're dedicated. Uh, those at the wrong end of the guns may have a somewhat different memory and perception uh, of the benefits of the empire, but uh, fortunately we don't hear from them. Uh, well, let me finally turn to uh, the description of Asia's role in the world today, the one that I quoted at the beginning from the Harrison Task Force study. Uh, some historians have suggested, not unrealistically, that the period of uh, European rule over a long, seen over a long stretch uh, might be seen as a kind of interregnum, that is a break of several centuries in a period of Asian dominance in many spheres. And that concern is very much alive. It's a prospect of deep concern to U.S. planners. Uh, the Northeast Asian problem that I mentioned is part of it, and the North Korea issue fits into it. Uh, for the Washington uh, neocons, uh, the dominant policymaking group, uh, China is quite openly regarded as the great potential enemy. Uh, a good deal of military planning is geared to that contingency, uh, notably missile defense, which is an offensive weapon, uh, part of a first strike capacity that's understood on all sides. The concerns over North Korea and uh, Northeast Asian integration, uh, they fall in the same framework. Uh, there are, have been recent efforts to strengthen uh, India-US strategic relations, and they're partly motivated by the same concerns, uh, along with concerns about controlling the world's largest energy reserves in the Middle East. One of the main reasons why the U.S. always insisted on controlling those since World War II was to have what uh, George Kennan called veto power uh, over others, specifically Japan, in case they ever got out of line. And if they move off in their own directions with their own independent energy resources, that's lost. Uh, part of the reasons that lie behind the current Iraq war. Well, there isn't much point uh, speculating about the future. Uh, human history is not something that we observe uh, from afar, like uh, the motions of the planets or the distant stars. Uh, human history is something that uh, humans create, and that leaves us with some truisms that are almost too obvious to mention. We're uniquely privileged. We enjoy a legacy of freedom and of opportunity that is shared by very few. Uh, privileges confer responsibility uh, to no slight extent. The shape of the future is in our hands, and I don't think uh, history will look kindly on us if we do not take up that uh, opportunity and responsibility. Professor Noam Chomsky speaking at the State University of New York at Stony Brook.
And that does it for our show. I want to encourage people to go to our newly launched website at democracynow.org. A very special thank you to our senior producer, Chris Abrams, who shepherded us through this process, as well as Eric Goldhaken and Jesse Hirsch of Open Flows, uh, who designed the website with Christos Deveras, also Dan Scott and Sarah Whiteley. Our website, democracynow.org. Our email address is mail, M A I L, at democracynow.org. Democracy Now! is produced by Chris Abrams, Mike Burke, Angie Karen, Sharif Abdul Kudus, Anna Noguera, Elizabeth Press, with help from Noah Rival and Vil Katsuras, who filmed uh, Noam Chomsky. Mike DeFilippo is our engineer with Rich Kim. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for listening and watching another edition of Democracy Now! <laughs>